Greetings, this is Victor. It's January 2021 and we're awaiting the release of the DCS Mi 24P this year. Let's talk about this amazing helicopter and shorten the time waiting for it. Now, there's a great two-part documentary in Russian and English available. There are interviews with Mi 24 pilots on YouTube and recently a one-hour walk-around has been uploaded. So I'm not going to talk about development, history or combat experience of this type. These things have already been dealt with in great detail. Check out the show notes for that. Instead, I'd like to compare the Mi 24P with a helicopter we already know from DCS. You've guessed it. I have picked the Mi 8 MTV2 for this task. By that, I will be comparing apples with oranges. However, I'm sure that we'll still find tons of similarities between these two and get to know the new toy a bit better. I'm not going to dive into deep system knowledge or show you how to operate the helicopter. That's all to come when the beast is released. Instead, I will focus on the general layout and then jump into the flight deck and point out the differences and similarities. Let's get started. Let's first take a look at weights and dimensions. Both types have roughly the same empty weight. 8500 kg for the Mi-24, 8700 kg for the Mi-8. This includes armor plates and external hardpoints on the Mi-8. Maximum takeoff weight for the Mi-24 is 11800 kg, while it is 13000 kg for the Mi-8. As for the fuel, the Mi-24 can carry 2100 liters and the Mi-8 loads 2,400 liters. Additionally, both can carry internal and external fuel tanks for long flights. So, if we fill up the standard fuel tanks, how much cargo or armament will we be able to lift? Well, the Mi-24 can carry 1,600 kg, while the Mi-8 will lift 2,400 kg. These are structural weights from the flight manual. Depending on the atmospheric conditions, such as the outside air temperature and pressure altitude, both helicopters may equally be able to lift more or might be restricted to less. So the Mi-8 is better at lifting weights, and that is something we did expect. It's a cargo helicopter after all. Let's take a look at the general dimensions of both types. Now, looking at both helicopters from the front really shows the sleek appearance of an attack helicopter on one side and the wide fuselage to carry cargo on the other side. However, they don't differ much in length. The Mi-8 fuselage is just about a meter longer than that of the Mi-24. The reason for that is the Mi-24's cargo compartment. Something you won't expect on an attack helicopter, but it was a requirement when the helicopter was designed. The idea of a versatile assault helicopter sounded reasonable in the late 60s, but that concept never proved to be very effective. Instead, the Mi-8 took the role of inserting and extracting troops, while the Mi-24 would provide cover. Now looking at both types from the top, you will notice that the main rotor blades of the Mi-24 are significantly shorter. The Mi-8 has a rotor diameter of 21.3 meters, while the Mi-24's rotor is only 17.3 meters wide. Both aircraft use the same engines in similar variants, the TV-3117, producing between 2100 and 2400 horsepower. So comparing the Mi-24P with the Mi-8 MTV-2, how can the helicopter lift almost the same weight with such a small rotor diameter? The secret lies in the rotor blades and the gearbox of the Mi-24. The blades are shorter, but their cord is 58 cm long, while it's 52 on the Mi-8. Also, the airfoil of the Mi-24 rotor extends further inward. In the end, both helicopters have the same rotor lift area, about 22 square meters. Additionally, the Mi-24 was equipped with a slightly different gearbox, delivering 240 rotor revolutions per minute versus 192 on the Mi-8. So the Mi-24's rotor spins 25% faster. So why all of this? Why not just follow the Soviet design doctrine of using the same component on as many types as possible? The answer is speed. The Mi-24's rotor design allows it to reach a significantly higher airspeed before the limiting phenomenon sets in, the retreating blade stall. Further design factors to reach high speeds were the wings that produce up to 25% of the helicopter's lift and the retractable landing gear. This takes us to a speed comparison. The Mi-24 reaches its maximum speed 
V and E at 335 kph. This is fast. The Mi 8 is limited to 250 kph. Cruising speeds are not that far apart, with the Mi 24 cruising at 250 kph and the Mi 8 at 220. However, that high V&E really helps the Mi 24 to dive safely, whether that is on a strafe run or during an escape maneuver. I have mentioned the wings. They are mounted with a negative dihedral, a downward angle. That's something we know from military jet aircraft like the Harrier. It increases roll rate and makes the aircraft more agile. However, it also induces instability around the roll axis. The Mi-24 comes with an autopilot that does a great job in stabilization mode. But you'll have to be extra careful when maneuvering at high bank angles. Or otherwise, you can easily end up in a spiral dive. The wings add additional lift when airspeed increases. So you'll be able to lower the collective and reduce engine power. However, you need to be aware of the reverse effect when approaching a hover. Lift from the wings will decrease down to zero and you'll have to compensate by pulling collective pitch. In hover, they don't help at all. Actually, the opposite is true. They disturb the airflow under the main rotor and reduce overall lift. There are many interesting design aspects about the Mi24. But there is a very important one that we have not yet talked about, and it's often overlooked. The asymmetric construction of the airframe. It shows really well when looking at the helicopter from both the front and the rear. Aft of the pilot's cockpit, the upper part of the fuselage is tilted by 2.5 degrees to the right. So is the tail boom and tail rotor, as well as the wings, the engines, the gearbox and the main rotor. So why all of that? Well, having flown the Mi-8 or other types of the same main layout, one main rotor and one anti-torque tail rotor, you are probably aware of such aerodynamic effects like the translating tendency. It is the reason why you'll see the Mi-8 flying with a small bank to the right at low speeds and in a hover. At higher air speeds, bank is decreased, but there is a drift, meaning the helicopter does not fly where the nose is pointing. In combination with other aerodynamic effects, this makes aiming of unguided weapons very demanding. So the designers of the Mi-24 did what they could to reduce as many of those effects as possible. The result is very convincing. At its cruising and maneuvering speeds, it has very high directional stability and very low drift. In short, it's easy to aim and hit a target. And that's something pilots like about the Mi-24. Finally, let's talk about armor. While the initial production model of the Mi-8, the Mi-8T, came with no armor whatsoever, that was later changed when the MT version appeared in the late 70s. Armor plates for the lower cockpit part were added. With the later MTV2 version, there was now an option to protect a part of the vital hydraulic fuel and oil systems aft of the main gearbox. Yet the situation for the pilots did not change much they were still sitting in a big and mostly unprotected glass nose. And the Mi-24, this is different. Armor was part of the construction from the start. Large steel plates protect the cockpit area from both sides. The operator's seating position is very low in the fuselage, so he is protected by additional steel side panels. The pilot's seat is armored and both front windshields are made of bulletproof glass. The engine, hydraulics, oil and fuel compartments received armor protection as well, yet large sections of the power plant and transmission systems as well as the cargo compartment remain unprotected. That's also a reason why the flight engineer usually stayed on the ground when the Mi-24 flew combat sorties in Afghanistan. So the Mi-24 has better armor, it's faster and better at hitting targets. And that is something we did expect. It's an attack helicopter after all. This is it for part one of this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. Tune in for the next part where we will take a detailed look at the flight deck.